Okay, there you have it. The Christian Livingstone method of vegetable and melon gardening. And I say that jokingly because I'm no expert and uh, as you may have figured out, you know, I developed this whole garden uh, as a novice and, uh, you know, I do it from a wheelchair. So uh, undoubtedly most or all of you watching this can do it too. And uh, if you don't think so, I've got a spare wheelchair you can buy. But yeah, the melons uh, do uh, uh, quite well uh, in direct planting. I uh, just seed planting right into the soil. And as you can see, I've got the uh, plastic uh, covered rows here. I like that. It keeps the weeds down and retains the moisture. And, uh, you know, planting at these early times, it, it keeps the uh, soil a little warmer so the plants, you know, think it's later than it is. So you can maybe plant earlier. Uh, what else? Uh, I've got some cages, and these are going to be for the uh, the uh, peppers, not uh, the tomatoes. I've got uh, uh, tomato plants, and I'm just going to let them just all hang out there. Uh, I've got a couple more rows behind me, and I'll show you uh, kind of quickly. This is pretty. Those were their peppers, but that was my... Uh, landlord's uh, row. I allotted a, a row to, to them and uh, they'd never planted anything to speak of, you know, edible agricultural stuff. But, and they did. They put a couple of uh, tomato plants per spot and, uh, you know, they got gobs of stuff and, uh, and they discovered they planted too many and, uh, you know, for just their small little family. So I kind of uh, took a note from them and, and I'm only going to have one plant in each spot because I don't need that uh, many tomatoes. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just out here uh, getting to it. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of tears in, in uh, some of the plastic here, and uh, we had a, a pretty wicked uh, hailstorm. And not only that, these larger tears. Uh, one of the horses uh, got back in here. Uh, some months ago, I wasn't here, but my neighbor came and got him out of here. So, you know, I've got my tape, and I'm going to be taping up. I'm going to be planting seeds. Uh, I've, I've got some of this uh, time-release fertilizer, this little granulated stuff. And, you know, this may not be your cup of tea, you know, this, this kind of stuff. Because it uh, may not technically fit uh, the... Uh, standard of organic uh, fertilizing practice, uh, but uh, I don't care about that. You know, this stuff isn't going to get into any water supply or drinking supply. It's all right here. So, uh, in some of these uh, uh, cases, I've uh, massaged, you know, a half a handful of this stuff into these, uh, these spots. And uh, that's how I'm going to replenish. Previously, I put uh, composted cow manure down in there and you know in some of the spots I can still feel and, and smell it so you know the organic matter I believe is still in these sites but uh, I'm going to boost it up a little bit because you know I've gone about three seasons now and uh, you know I don't know if I've sucked all the nutrients out or the organic matter's all used up but uh, you know this is just kind of a an added measure. And who knows how long I'll be here. I want to get the most out of this uh, garden on here. So, uh, yeah, I'm taping up, I'm planting, I'm fertilizing, you know, I'm uh, doing something new with uh, having peppers and a more serious effort towards uh, tomatoes. On the other side, uh, the one closest to that tree line, you get a little shade in the afternoon, and that's where I'm going to be planting uh, lettuce. And I had uh, uh, a good experience with lettuce the first time last season. I've never really had a problem with pests or insects uh, on the uh, plants before, but uh, the cantaloupe uh, this season, usually it's very robust and I don't have to worry about it. I just put the seeds in and they take off and rah. And, uh, but this season they, they are, they're kind of plagued by some 
kind of aphid-like critters on the underside of the leaves and it seems to be depressing the plants some. So I'm, uh, you know, using a, a two-pronged approach in uh, dealing with that and that is the diatomaceous earth which is non-toxic and you may know that they're, uh, you know, like ancient uh, little crustacean critters uh, fossilized in sea beds and lake beds and uh, you know they can grind them up and use them for uh, uh, pool uh, filters and uh, people will actually even drink this in water you, you put it in water and it'll uh, clean out your uh, intestines and stuff so you know it's it's not harmful it's it's you know easy going stuff but uh, on insects, the uh, exoskeletal insects, and most of them are, you know, they uh, have uh, uh, body uh, parts that move as like tubes and inside those joints, this stuff gets in because it's virtually all silica, I believe, and, and it, you know, wreaks havoc on them. So we're going to use this and uh, we're going to go a little chemical warfare too with uh, another powder that is actually a uh, you know, a pesticide, but uh, apparently it also uh, uh, works against diseases in the plant itself. So it, it, it kills the pests and uh, combats against diseases somehow. So this is kind of a two-pronged approach and I'm putting these two things together and uh, mixing it up in here, a little dusting powder and uh, going up under the uh, plants. And I'll show you right now what those uh, critters look like. A little ape, but it's like critters. And there they are. You can see I've already sprayed here. I sprayed a couple of days ago, but this is what it looks like. And, you know, they might already be dying from uh, me spraying, uh, dusting, uh, you know, two days ago. But there was uh, some rain last night, so I've come back out here to take a look and, you know, there was a lot of uh, ladybugs last year, and uh, I, I believe they probably took care of this stuff. And they might, it might be better already. I can see these things are just kind of falling off as I move them. I don't think they're alive, but whatever they are, they were undoubtedly alive at one point. So that's what it looks like. You know, it's, it hasn't killed off the plants too much, but uh, I think it's depressing them. And, uh, as you can see over here, the, uh, the blossoms still seem to be intact, but down there, that one, not so much. So, you know, with no blossoms, no fruit. So, and this is the uh, second row, and they don't seem to have it as much. But I dusted them the other day, and we'll see how they do. See, there's one that's dead, pretty much. But this, this last row really picked it up, so... And out in the rest of the garden, it's doing fine. Now, those, those two rows there, that's uh, watermelon and uh, the tomatoes. They don't seem to be affected. So it's mostly right down on this end row. And so I'll dust again, and uh, we'll just watch it and see how it goes. What I'm finding uh, here, it's towards the uh, end of uh, August, and uh, all three of our groups in the tomato uh, rows, uh, the me, the neighbor, uh, the uh, landlord, have been uh, uh, getting uh, tomatoes for the last 30 days or more. And uh, it seems like about every five days, you know, it's time to go back in there and collect up all these tomatoes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's more than enough, believe me. But uh, as you'll see, we'll go around and I'll collect up some and, and you'll just get an idea of uh, uh, what they uh, uh, produce and uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty much believing that most of the varieties that I've planted and everybody else here has planted are the uh, indeterminate uh, varieties rather than the determinate and apparently that's just a, an abbreviated way to say that the uh, plants that are indeterminate tomato varieties will keep on producing throughout the season and the determinate ones are ones that you know, they blossom, fruit up, and mature, and, and after you pick them, you know, that's pretty much it. So you get less of them uh, than the indeterminate varieties because, you know, these babies just keep coming. And so, you know, I'm 
thinking that uh, these are mostly uh, indeterminate varieties, which, you know, I think most people would prefer. And here is uh, my row. Similarly, it's uh, just brimming, so to speak, with ready-to-pluck tomatoes. And any, anything with color is uh, what I'll pick. So even uh, with uh, all the cast-offs and the uh, uh, scarred-up ones and bruised ones, uh, you know, I'm guessing uh, they'll be... Uh, 200 to 250 pounds uh, gotten off that one row and uh, you know that's quite a bit so 250 pounds uh, under 20 bucks out of pocket expense you know I'm watering of course with well water so there's no expense there you know except the energy to push the pump and so yeah you know, especially if you have kids and uh, you're eating a lot of tomatoes, uh, salads, and BLTs or whatever. That's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be eating a lot of BLTs and giving a lot of this, this these tomatoes away. So, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, I'd recommend uh, plant some tomatoes. Have some fun with it. They're uh, really uh, not much trouble, and uh, there is a, a pretty good return for what it costs out of pocket. And maybe I'll just give you a quick uh, overview of, uh, you know, the watering process. Open these up. Close that one. And there we go. We're off. I got all four heads going at the same time since I changed them to a, uh, a plastic uh, rainbird head uh, and uh, I put the uh, more restrictive nozzles, the red nozzle, and uh, that gives them more velocity so I can have more of them uh, going at the same time and getting the, the same good long distance throw out of them. Yeah, it's fun to see them doing, doing their thing out there. And this is, you know, well water. It doesn't cost a dime to, uh, to put that water out there, except the electricity, maybe. So, yeah, you know, especially uh, if you've got uh, well water, that would be a, a better reason to have a garden this size. If not, you know, city water, paid-for water is probably a little costly, unless you're real smart about how you water. I'm not. I, I just put those impact sprinklers and just let it fly. I haven't uh, used uh, uh, cages for the tomato plants or I haven't staked them out and put the strings uh, uh, along to hold the plants up and uh, I'm finding yeah that uh, that was a little needless uh, 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 you know added work and, and trouble because uh, I'm getting plenty off these uh, and uh, uh, you know if you're a professional gardener in a nursery somewhere maybe that's how you do it but uh, I'm finding I don't need to do that and uh, the one downside is is early on when the uh, tomato plants fruit up and you know in the wind without the support they've thrashed around a little bit that lower fruit will have probably become bruised, especially if you're, you know, on the Great Plains area of North America, there's, there's wind. And uh, so those lower first fruits are going to get bruised. They might look like they're, they're just right, but when you go to pick them on the underside, they'll be bruised and you'll say, oh, no, you know, I'm not going to get as much as I thought, but don't worry about it. You throw those out and then, uh, you know, more fruit will come and you'll forget all about that. Uh, you know, those first bruised ones. I'll so, uh, mention also that there is a technique of pruning the uh, tomato plants. Uh, you know, it's a technique that I don't practice because, you know, I'm not that picky. I get more tomatoes than I know what to do with. But I'll just uh, point it out to you and, uh, uh, you know, suggest that if you only have a few plants, yeah, maybe go ahead and really you know, do all the right things so you get the best and or most out of out of your plant if you're working with small spaces. But uh, you know, I've got a big, large area here, so 
you know, I'm not that picky. But uh, anyway, to prune these uh, tomato plants, uh, you know, when you see the uh, stalks uh, dividing at these kind of uh, points here, these uh, uh, ones that uh, develop right in that little armpit area, you just uh, pluck those off. And these are called suckers, and apparently that is a better way. And, you know, those don't seem to fruit up or blossom uh, like the other parts of the plant. So if you if you get rid of those, uh, the, generally I believe the whole plant will do better and you'll get more fruit. To... And in the wind, the tomato plants can get to flopping around in high winds over prolonged periods. Now, interestingly, it wasn't a problem last season, so maybe we got more wind. And as you can see, these plants are kind of pushed over from the wind. And uh, they're not growing up, uh, you know, perfectly straight up tall as, as they usually might. But uh, on the one uh, row or the half a row where my friend planted the two together and it's a little tighter spacing on that row, it's like a, a walled fortress. They are standing up tall and strong and, and it wasn't an issue. But for my row and my landlord's row, one single plant in each spot in some places did take a beating and some of the plants even uh, got thrashed and portions of it broke off. And so, <clears throat> you know, I thought, oh, how am I going to deal with that? You know, I mean, I could probably leave things as they were and maybe suffer, uh, you know, 8% uh, of the plant spoilage or, you know, damage from, from the element. But uh, I thought, nah, let me, uh, let me do something kind of intermediate in, in a stage of uh, something between the cage and nothing at all and I came up with this just some wire hoops uh, to pin the plants down in, in the state they're at uh, you know if they're blown over that way the root system tends to adapt to it you know but if it comes thr thrashing back the other way then you know it gets that that breakage so uh, what I'm doing is just taking some of this baling wire here and making these hoops and pinning the plants down where they're at in this fashion. Okay, there it is. Same on this one here. And so it's, it's just going to tend to hold them where they're at, and they'll grow and fruit up and, and be fine like that, I, I'm guessing. So that's what I'm doing to deal with that uh, issue of no cages, high winds, and, uh, you know, preventing some of that, uh, you know, breakage on, on the plants. So, uh, oh yeah, let me show you the other row where there's two together tighter spacing and you'll see how strong that is so you know that's a solution in itself do, 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 do. see that row over there look at those babies they don't need no stinking cages they don't need no hoops pin them, pinning them down strong they've suffered uh, you know just like these ones but you can see these ones got blown over. Other ones, not so much. So you just uh, you just never know. You know the plants have their own. Now I put two more plants in there, and those are the remnants of the plants that got thrashed. But eh, they might make it back up. So anyway, that's my solution. Just pinning them down with little hoops of wire. Uh, as you can see, right there. Just pin them down where they're at and see how it goes. Since we've had a lot more moisture this uh, spring and summer, it's interesting how uh, the uh, amphibians, namely the uh, toads, uh, have been so numerous. And even uh, um, the uh, box turtles have been cruising through here a lot more than usual. So. Uh, you know, with the, the water comes uh, more uh, species. And uh, the funny thing about this uh, uh, toad uh, tendency is is that there's been so many, they, they've they kind of uh, taken a, uh, a pesticide uh, role in my uh, uh, garden here. And 
there'll be almost every other uh, uh, spot for the uh, seedlings here. These are the, uh, oh, I put in a new variety of uh, leaf lettuce that I like because uh, these are the ones, this Simpson, black seeded Simpson, they're not a lot of crunch to it. Otherwise, they're okay, but uh, so I uh, came up with uh, another uh, one I'm, I'm, you know, trying is uh, it's called white Paris, and I think it's kind of like a romaine lettuce. They put it in Caesar salad, but uh, so hopefully that'll give me some crunch. But uh, in the meanwhile, I'm going to squirt with this uh, pump sprayer just some water onto these holes, and I'm going to show you what uh, uh, happens and how the toad plays the role uh, of uh, uh, pest control uh, here, because. Uh, I don't see one there. I don't see one there. I was out here earlier. Let's see if we can flush one out. I don't know, they're hiding. Oh, there's one. There's one. There he goes. But yeah, he, uh, He hides in there, and any little, uh, you know, bugs and worms that go cruising through there and want to gnaw on the lettuce, uh, you know, he'll just, uh, you know, grab them with his tongue. And he's, he's not the only one. There's more of them in there. There's another one of them critters watching over my cantaloupes. The cantaloupe. Look at him. Let's wait for something to come by so we can eat it. Mm. The uh, telltale sign on this particular uh, uh, variety, which is Crimson Sweet, uh, doesn't really give uh, a good indication uh, from the underside. You know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, on the underside of the uh, watermelon, you know, you, you can tell by the color. Uh, on this particular variety, not so much. Other varieties uh, that I've planted, like uh, Sugar Baby, there is a, an indication when it turns yellow or even orange. That is a, a, a clear uh, indicator. You know, not a perfect indicator, but uh, it's one of them. So anyway, uh, on this, not so much. The, the underside color, uh, you know, I don't pay attention to that. The tendrils, yes. The size, yes. Uh, the, you know, the timing of the in the plant's life cycle, yes. You know, these these plants go, I think, uh, 90 to 120 days uh, uh, in their life cycle, and that's one indication. So, you know, I know how long these have been going. So, you know, I, I pretty much know that they're getting ready. And uh, the tendrils is the next. Uh, one I look at and also there is a, a tendency to uh, have the uh, color on the top of the melon get a little dullish on top and that's another indicator and uh, oh I guess another one I'll sometimes check for uh, lastly maybe is the uh, the weight density if the sucker feels heavy for its size that's a good sign to me so you know that's pretty much the extent of my knowledge about uh, you know when to uh, cut the uh, the watermelon. You know, like I said, the cantaloupe a lot easier. So anyway, that's a, I think a good overview. And you know, if you're wondering why the plastic rose, uh, you know, I've only been doing this three seasons, but uh, the first uh, season I just got out here and made mounds and planted plants and watered them and you know I got good results you know I never planted anything I'm not a hippie and you know I'm not a purist and don't really care that much about organic food but uh, so-called organic food you know it's all organic but uh, I did uh, do some research the next uh, season because uh, there was a lot of weeds and uh, you know that was uh, laborsome you know to to pluck weeds so much so uh, I uh, read some uh, white papers from universities and industry uh, uh, commentary and uh, you know they said uh, for uh, melons these 
plastic covered rows really have a lot of benefits. It gives you higher yields, it keeps the weeds down, it causes the uh, uh, plants to have better root development too because they'll go down for the water and uh, along the, the edges of each one of these rows are holes plucked down right below the surface so the, the water leaches under and uh, you know during the uh, seedling stage and the germination stage I, I do water a little bit more because initially they need to get water from those slits and uh, so uh, that's where the seedlings and uh, you know the seeds themselves are getting the water from the top so in that those early stages especially it's cooler during the, that time when you're planting uh, you know they germinate and go to seedling quite nice and uh, later in the plant stage uh, you know the the sprinklers will catch on the leaves and filter down through those uh, slits and uh, down below as well so uh, you know it, it works out well and uh, I suppose one other uh, benefit or one of the other benefits is the uh, tendency also for the plastic to sterilize the soil from you know the spores and funguses like the uh, fusarium wilt and uh, I dealt with that that first season and uh, you know they said uh, you know that's one way but it takes a few years to sterilize the soil and it's better just to shift to a, uh, a variety of melon uh, that is uh, resistant to the fusarium wilt and that's what I did I uh, shifted to a different variety and it uh, responded a lot better in this soil which apparently has that uh, fusarium wilt sp spore so uh, you know there's a, a lot of things uh, you know that led me to say oh yeah I I want to uh, you know have plastic over these rows and uh, you know a hippie might not like that he might say oh man this that's synthetic man you don't you don't want to put synthetic in your garden man but uh, yes I do I really really do so uh, yeah that's the overview there's about eight rows here and uh, there's one there that's uh, half uh, melon and uh, half tomato that I've allotted to a, a neighbor and uh, the landlord's got one that it's it's full of uh, tomatoes and uh, so yeah you know you can share you know space and because people seem to like to participate in this I you know I'm not trying to make a community garden I, I really don't even recommend inviting people you know to come in because they don't really follow through so much not that it bugs me too much but I'm, I'm sure it would bug someone else I've had to kind of nag uh, you know the landlord and my buddy about you know come on let's get those plants in I don't want to wait around for, for you okay I will you know and finally they get around to it and you got to tell them oh it's now's the time to come and pick them come on oh I will blah 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 everybody's busy so you know, I don't really recommend getting other people involved, but I have more space than I need, and I, I really don't want as much fruit as this would produce, uh, you know, if this was all my planting. So, I, I, you know, they're doing me a service just by coming here and taking some of this stuff away. And uh... Hey, look, it's a sweet pepper. <laughs> Yeah, I planted a few of those. My neighbor friend from down the street, he's got a row in the garden here. And he's going to show us about the slip on these cantaloupe. Just how easy they come off. What'd that feel like? About a pound or two of pressure? Yeah, I just barely push on it. Okay, a pound or less probably. Yeah, these babies are ripe, so... That they, one fell right yeah, off. Yeah, they just fall right just off. Just by pulling on it. Okay, so that's what you call the slip. It's very easy. If you feel too much resistance, it's it's probably not uh, ripe yet. But these are pretty pretty easy to know when they're ripe. They're yellow in color, and uh, and that's how it works. Hey there, young lady. Um, do you have any um cantaloupe with like a bad spot on it? Yeah, there you go. Because my crab. Your what? I have a hermit crab and it needs to eat and it won't eat anything else besides cantaloupe. Oh, 
Come on. Those are good ones there. They'll eat how do the how do the crabs eat the cantaloupe when they live underwater? No, that isn't underwater. It's a hermit <laughs> they don't. crab. Oh, a hermit crab. Okay. Yeah, the kids buy them hermit crabs, and they actually just live in an aquarium. What do you know? That's all they eat is cantaloupe. <laughs> all right. Okay, that captures the essence, I think, of what the slip is. Yeah, cool deal. Yeah, uh, I was telling him if they need a tomato or something, you know, come over and get... I've been shoveling oh, yeah, tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're good. Yeah, we're good deal. Yeah, yeah. We can't keep up with it. I know. Okay. And you saw that one row. That's the yeah. landlords, and they've hardly picked any. They're yeah. just rotten there. I, they just blew up all of a sudden. I didn't know they were going well, crazy. Well, I, I went to the... Went to, the store and I picked up uh, they, they was on the shelf you know with the clearance deal they was a couple little bitty small watermelons and so I, I picked them up and, and of course the kids just went crazy over them and I looked over there and, and uh, they're, they're feeding it to the, the box turtle and the, and the hermit crab and I go well Leah all you gotta do is go holler at Christian I said he's got all kinds of stuff oh there. sure As a matter of fact, well, some of these box them. turtles, they do cruise through here and they will try to gnaw yeah, into yeah, them. Yeah. 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 For every good one, I think bad yeah. Well, I was talking to a guy the other day and he was talking, yeah, he says, I got uh, probably about 50 foot square. And he says, I put cantaloupe in. And I said, yeah. I said, how's it going? And he says, really great. And uh, he says, but whatever I, whatever I plant, he says, I, I plant no. one for me and two for the turtles. <laughs> you know, surprisingly, uh, like his row there has got a, a lot of uh, ripe uh, cantaloupe, and normally the possums or the skunks would just shred those because oh, yeah. once they get ripe, they throw off a real a strong yeah. fragrance, yeah. Uh -huh. but they haven't touched them. I, I haven't seen it. Last year when you were having cantaloupe, I've seen all kinds of possums. Varmints. I haven't seen any this year. No, before. me too. I haven't put the, the trap out for, for any yeah. reason. Well, last year, every time we come out and sit on the deck, I go, well, the, the skunks are feeding the Christians, you know, because we can smell them. Right. And then, but this year, we haven't seen anything. Yeah. Yeah, I, I trapped and killed, uh, you know, a half a dozen uh, or more skunks and possums last year. Probably a dozen the yeah. year before. So yeah. there's just no reason to now. They're 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 kind of lean. Let me see if I can get a little action out of him by just bringing him up here. Oh yeah, he got his mouth wide open. There he is. North American marsupial. Rawr. I'm not going to bug him too much. I wonder how come some of them are green. Do you want this one picked? No, no. no. Wait, he, are they ready? When they turn that pale, White. pale yellow, yeah. And then you'll know with the slip on the uh, vine, you just a little bit of pressure and they'll come off. More uh, cantaloupe. Yeah, I, yeah. And I like that idea because, uh, you know, I'll get some now and hopefully later too. Have you uh, met uh, Billy and Stacy on the corner, Whitney? And this is Stacy. Yeah. He's got a great big one, twice the size. See, I would have left that till tomorrow, but since they were begging, coveting, like and puppies out there. drooling, you know. Oh, is she? There's a million cantaloupes over there.
best I've ever had. Well, you know, flattery will get she you some cantaloupe. She said the ones cantaloupe. that they ain't sweet. I bought cantaloupe at the farmer's market too, and they were nasty. Oh, that's where you got all those cantaloupe. Good boy. Good boy. like them yeah awesome. yeah they are they're uh, sweet they're juicy uh, they're easy to grow I you know hopefully you save some of those seeds that's what I should have did. <laughs> is that how you restart them by saving the seeds sure sure okay, I did not know anything about it. I've, I've still got uh, a few more coming so uh, if I remember I'll save some for you You know they do. They vine out and spread out. But uh, if you uh, take about three or four seeds and plant them about uh, three quarters of an inch deep, and you get a couple of, uh, or you get, let's say, all of them come up, and then thin them out to about two plants per spot, and that'll cover about uh, you know six, eight foot diameter. Yeah, what it'll take. It'll take a little room, but uh, you can get two plants in the same spot. And then, and then you can kind of hem in the vines, too. If you need the space, you can push them together and kind of crowd them up. So, yeah, like I say, if I, if I recall or remember, uh, actually, I do have some seeds all, already, so I, I will. I'll remember, and I'll just bring more around sometime or keep a handful in my wallet maybe.
do a big guy. Good, good. We're going to, I don't know who's is who's, I'm just Make them go away. Make well, them go we're away. We're going to try. We, uh, Braxton's been helping me. We're going to pick, uh, and my sister and her family, and, uh, well, Whitney must work. So Tammy and I, and she said and something. Bonnie and Donnie will be doing tomatoes Friday morning. Yeah, she said something. I uh, told her I don't cook that way, so, you know, I don't know what to do with canned tomatoes. Yeah, well, uh. Right. Yeah, I, I just I don't cook that way too much. I'm a kind of a lazy cook. Yeah. Yeah, he climbs on like a monkey. Kind of cool how the two of them get along so well. Yeah, we were really surprised. I thought Charlie didn't like cats. Because at first, they kind of collided and he was like doing a lot of growling at her. Right, right. Once he put her outside with him, I think the tables had turned and I think he's a little bit scared of her because she's got a lot of fucking... And nose. he's protective of the cat from like that dog next door, Mimi. Apparently, he got in between the two of them through the fence. so. He oh, really? protects the little kitty, and uh, oh, I even saw Charlie picking it up by the head in his jaws and moving it out to the grass. And I thought, oh, it's dead, you know. He, Charlie killed it, being playful and friendly. But no, he did it just enough, and dro and I clapped my hands, and the cat dropped out of his jaws and ran off. And oh, whew. Huh. <laughs> You know, because Charlie will pick up these moles and other things and yeah. play with them until they're croaked. Yeah. But uh, no, he's he's gentle with that one. And they play. Oh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> See, he's got him in a lockjaw there. Yeah. Hey. But, yeah. It's it's funny. Okay, you're in luck, Mr. Man Man. There is one that was just about ready for picking out there. Well, I don't want to take it if you're going to be using it. No, there's more soon. coming. There's okay. more coming. But yeah, they've kind of winded down the melons. Thank you. What What is their general ripening season? For All season. You All season, depending on when you plant them. Ground. Yeah. I planted some at different times, and uh, this little half a row, I planted that uh, uh, later than the others, so they're still putting out pretty good. And then I, I had a problem with some aphids, and I uh, uh, just ripped them out and replanted, and I don't know if they're, they're going to uh, throw yet. You know, if yeah. it, it starts to get cold, you know, you'll get the, the, the slowing down process, and then they'll never make it. So is this ready? Oh yeah. Because I, I, I can't tell a ripe or a, sure. a, a, it's ready. Right. Yeah, this one, as soon as they're yellow like that, they're, they're ready. ready to go. And the netting looks pretty even on that, so I'm guessing that one's going to be in good, 
good space. Uh, I like to leave them out at room temperature for, for several hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I really appreciate that. So yeah, save those seeds out of that and uh, then plant them. Really? Absolutely. Oh. Yeah, that is the uh, sugar cube variety. Plant a few of them in one little spot, or do you kind of move them? Just a couple of seeds. Well, those, uh, you know, the uh, cantaloupe uh, vines out, you know, voluminously. They yeah. really spread out. So yeah, uh, spread them out. Uh, you don't have to have a row of them, but uh, you Let know. Let them dry and then put them in the ground, or do you just the seeds? Yeah, scrape the seeds out, put them in a colander or something, rinse them and dry them. Don't let them stay damp or they'll start germinating, but uh, rinse them out and let them dry and uh, you'll have them for next season. Yeah. We'll try that. Thank you. You may also know that I'm a Christian anarchist. I don't have a uh, social security number, a state driver's license. I'm not a U.S. citizen. I'm not an immigrant either, but... Uh, and that leads into some of the uh, thinking behind a garden. I'm not really a prepper at all, but, uh, you know, we know that uh, these hostile state organizations throughout history, uh, once they take over a money supply and the coinage, they start to debase or devalue the currency, and uh, U.S. currency is certainly uh, no different, uh, especially since 1971 when uh, Richard Nixon uh, closed the gold window for international uh, settlement purposes because, you know, if you know a little bit uh, about the history, uh, after uh, World War II, the Bretton Woods Agreement put pretty much the whole world on the U.S. dollar standard for, you know, trading, and especially oil, and uh, that's starting to change. And, uh, you know, when the convertibility of the dollar uh, to gold uh, uh, closed in 1971, you know, pretty much the whole world went to a, uh, a fiat currency uh, standard. And so, you know, the Vietnam War was going on and that was one way to uh, uh, keep printing up money and calling it into existence out of thin air uh, and without uh, having to raise taxes to, you know, kill those three million poor Vietnamese people uh, that the U.S. government was on a, a genocidal and homicidal campaign to do, needlessly, foolishly, stupidly, maniacally. But anyway, uh, uh, for us uh, here on the North American continent, uh, that means uh, inflation since those days uh, you know, has gone up uh, considerably. Back in uh, 1971, uh, you know, you could buy a, a brand new, modest car, uh, you know, reasonably equipped for a couple thousand dollars, and now it's about ten times that much. So, uh, you know, that's inflation. You know, you can try to hide it, and you know, the state and the federal states uh, do. They they try to hide it, they change uh, the index and how it's all calculated, but. It's, pretty obvious that uh, prices keep going up and it's not that any other factors have changed. It's the, it's the loss in the purchasing power. So how that uh, relates to uh, gardening is that, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, you know, the division of labor still keeps food prices down. So food is still a very good value historically. There's really never been a, a better time in human history to, you know, purchase food with, uh, you know, currency. If you, if you do other kinds of work, you know, you don't have to toil, uh, uh, you know, day in, day out, year in, year out, just to have food and uh, shelter, you know, like they did a hundred or more years ago. And uh, so it's a very small percentage, uh, historically, that, you know, it takes to, uh, to feed your family, feed yourself. So I suggest taking advantage of the division of labor, the low food prices. You know, I'm not a prepper, but you know, as a Christian anarchist, I, I know that, uh, you know, a, a collapse of the currency and devaluations are, are coming. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'm a guy over 50 years old and 
you know, I'm not really doing this to uh, prep, you know, but I, I wanted to try it. I have the uh, space here that I rent, so, uh, you know, I just wanted to do it. Uh, the place availed itself uh, to me, and I had the time, so I, I went ahead and did it, and uh, this is my third season doing it. And, uh, you know, I recommend you try, try it, especially maybe if you have uh, kids and a lot of mouse to feed that way, especially if you're homeschooling, keeping them out of those, uh, you know, extortion-funded public schools that hold everybody's homes hostage for ransom and property taxes. And, uh, you know, maybe put them to work in the garden so they get to see the whole supply chain, you know, instead of just thinking, you know, the stuff magically comes into the supermarket. You know, they can see the whole, the whole chain. And uh, other than that, uh, yeah, the division of labor, food costs are low right now. Uh, you know, undoubtedly a collapse will come with uh, the currency. But uh, in the meanwhile, just uh, I suggest take uh, the money right now you have and uh, start uh, socking away maybe 100 pounds of uh, sugar, wheat, beans, rice, you know, powdered milk, instant potatoes, stuff like that. And don't worry about growing all your stuff, canning all your own stuff. Right now, the food values are still one of the few things that uh, are uh, good. But also, maybe develop some of these skills. Learn, uh, you know, what uh, what grows well in your area, what you like to eat. And that's what I do here. A lot of melons. I like melons. They don't uh, take uh, any cooking, so you know, I'm a bachelor. I, I think that way. Easy, simple. Uh, other than that, uh, oh, the currency, division of labor, and uh, you know, a lot of people around me or somewhat close to me, uh, you know, are into gardening is kind of a, a neo-pagan uh, thing, and, you know, I, I, I'm not into that at all. I don't think, you know, you get closer to God in the garden or in the forest, you know, and, no, no. I mean, you know, good food is uh, uh, good for, for the body, and uh, but, you know, you don't get the body, you know, in a harmonic frequency balance and then become you know, able to communicate with God, and, you know, you don't find God in the garden. A lot of neo-pagan, new agers with, you know, the kind of the window dressing of Christianity like to, like to imply that. I don't buy that at all. You know, God's not in the garden, so get your head out of that, that place, I think. But, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, sure, it's fun, and, uh, as uh, you've seen on the video, uh, there's a, a social aspect, too, that uh, can be had with gardens like this, especially if you invite people to, you know, uh, participate. You know, my landlord, uh, he's got a row, and uh, some neighbors down the street, they've got a row, and so, you know, I'm kind of letting other people do it, because I'm getting kind of tired, you know. So I don't know what I'll do next uh, season. I might... Uh, plant less somehow, but uh, I suppose I'll, I'll keep it going uh, as long as I'm here, but it, after that, uh, you know, on the New Jerusalem Times YouTube channel, I, I may have some more projects coming pretty soon with uh, the electric hand cycle. Uh, I'm getting pretty close to uh, energizing both of the rear wheels to have a two-wheel drive in the rear, and uh, I don't think it's been done. You know, there's uh, uh, two-wheel bicycles that have the uh, electric hub motors, one in the front and one in the rear, and that's two-wheel drive, but, you know, that's not the same. And there is a, a guy who uh, has a, uh, a Delta truck, or a, uh, a tadpole trike that he developed. That is the two front wheels uh, uh, and one in the back, and the two front wheels are driven, and they do the turning, but he's having a little difficulty with spokes braking. <coughs> But, uh, so I think he's the one uh, doing, uh, you know, 
all-time first in that area. But uh, as far as the Delta trike, two-wheel drive uh, in the rear, I don't think anybody's doing it. And I'm getting real close to, uh, you know, get my throttle wiring to the two controllers hooked up on this. Uh, and so uh, that's coming down the pipe. For any of you uh, who are interested in uh, electric bikes, and uh, like I said, I uh, roll around here in a wheelchair and uh, but otherwise I roll around the neighborhood and go into the supermarket on this thing and then the basket in the back put all my groceries in there and just roll right out of there and right into my living room on this thing so this is a lot of fun this is another one of my projects and I've got a couple other projects I'll be doing this winter but uh, the summer season has uh, pretty much quieted down now, so I'm, I'm kind of I'm getting, I'm getting my, uh, my mind into the uh, winter projects. I've got a, a truck that I drive, and of course, again, not with a state driver's license, but uh, I drive it, and, you know, it's got uh, some risks because uh, the state is a hostile organization. And, uh, you know, if you don't get all their permission slips, uh, they'll hurt you. Even though you've done nothing wrong. But that's a different story. So, anyway, peace be with you, and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay? Bye-bye.